Before I begin today, I will apologize if I offend or upset anyone. It's not your fault. No, no, it's not your fault. I, I still apologize. Uh, normally, I do try to avoid political type commentary from the pulpit. Uh, today, I'm not going to do that. So, in advance, again, I don't want to offend. I am trying to merely reveal, perhaps, what I'm revelation, for want of a better word, uh, and to add some clarity and some rational thinking, hopefully, to a very irrational and very emotional time. The scripture we're going to look at today is found in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 16. Cain murders Abel. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not, do not do well. Sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. <coughs> story of violence. Right there in the beginning. Creation story and now we have violence. It's a horrible, horrible story if you really stop and think about it. Now, most of the time when I was growing up, the illustrations of this story showed Cain with a rock going to smash his brother's skull. So we have the rock is what is imagery that, that so often time, you may have seen different pictures, but the ones I can remember in the children's Bibles had a rock, not unlike this rock. But the interesting thing to note is in the scripture doesn't tell us what he used to kill his brother. Does it say what the tool, the weapon that he used to kill his brother? No, it doesn't say a thing about the weapon. And that's significant, and that's important, because this is a story about violence, not a story about rocks, or stones, or strangulation, or whatever you might have. Violence, that's the key to this story. This envy, this anger, this angst, whatever drove Cain, do we want to believe, to do this horrifying thing? Horrific act right here in the beginning of the blessing of creation we have in the Bible. All the wonderful things, and then all of a sudden we have Bradside. He's killed his brother, his 
home level for a while. Today we live in a society where we see news on the TV and we're, we're praying today for the folks down there in, in Parkland, Florida from the Marjorie Stone and Douglas High School where the latest school attack was, the school violence. I don't want to call it a shooting, he knows, because the problem with that, and today I actually wanted to bring for an illustration a weapon, a gun. And my wife, being the more rational thinker, said, no, some people would be freaked out by that. But that's the point, isn't it? The gun. People are focusing on the gun. The story is about the shooting, about the school shooting. It's not a shooting, it's violence. People are talking about doing legislation to regulate guns. As a person that purchases guns once in a while, there's a lot of regulations on purchasing guns. Could there be an additional regulation, perhaps, to say that you have to be 21 to buy a weapon? I'm fine with that. That, that probably makes sense. And I'm all for common sense, rational, logical regulation. That probably, that might have done something to slow this kid down. But would it have stopped him? No. The one thing about these acts of school violence, if you go start researching them, and I, the last few days I've been on the internet, I've been talking to people that I know, I've been, I've been out trying to glean information and insight and knowledge. But most people don't do that. Most people just jump and they react. And that's what we do as humans. It's a, it's a gun. It's scary. We're afraid. Let's get rid of them. Nobody should have one of those. Why do you need one of those? But why do you need 3,000 calories on your dinner plate? You don't. But we're not going to regulate that, I believe. But the bottom line is, is it's not the gun. Have we taken all the guns away? Somehow we would pass legislation and we confiscate every weapon, all the weapons that I have in my collection that, that mean things to me that people wouldn't understand. I, mean, I may talk about that or I may not yet today. But those weapons, if they suddenly evaporated into the ether of time and space, would it have stopped this act of violence? No. This is a premeditated act. He wanted to get back, as the kids said, beautifully enough, revenge. Because this is a kid that had been picked on. This is a kid that had been bullied. This is a kid that had been shuffled and life had dealt him a bad hand. His, first of all, whatever the situation was with his birth parents, he was put up for adoption. A lot of times I've met people that were adopted and they have some issues with that adoption. Whether they're the most well-adjusted people or not, there's some little gnawing thing there. Next, his parents died, and all of these circumstances that this poor child had in his life that set him up, and amongst them is bullying. When you start researching these school acts of violence, whether they're shooting or whether there's some other thing, because for, you know, realize if he wanted to cause chaos and mayhem, he could have made a bomb. There's plenty of videos on YouTube showing you how to make bombs. There's he could have taken the money that he used to buy that AR, which is just an automatic, it doesn't mean automatic rifle, it means aerolite rifle, and there's plenty of, you know, the, to purchase a, an AR, he probably invested roughly a thousand dollars in what he had there. They're not cheap. You know, guns are not cheap. Ask my poor, my long suffering wife, guns are not cheap. Uh, so he probably had a thousand dollars. For a thousand dollars, you can buy a clunker of a car. Could have pulled the fire alarm, jumped in his car, and mowed down more than 17 kids. If he wanted violence, he could do it. It doesn't matter what tool you take away from him. In this country, more people are killed every year with hammers than all rifles, ARs, AKs, bolt actions, lever actions, you name it. All rifles combined, more people are killed with hammers every year than with rifles. If I want to do violence, I can do a lot of violence with this. I can do a lot of violence with that. A lot of my minister friends are wrapped up on this legislative, that's, that's, you know, guns, guns, guns. In fact, Greg Mamela, and I hate to name names, who came and preached in my absence, I, last week I talked about rebuking. Well, I rebuked him online this week, and then I got rebuked by other ministers because I was rebuking him for focusing on the gun and not the violence. 
You want to pray for gun regulations. It's like, no, you want, we need to pray for how are we going to deal with violence? How are we going to deal with that stain on that soul that, raises, that causes him to want to take a human life? <clears throat> it's nothing to do with the tool, the weapon. I could, I could get rid of every tool and every weapon. If I want to do violence, I will do it. So what are we going to do? We're going to spend our time making legislation that we know will not pass so we can score political points against the other political party? Are we going to gin up a bunch of emotion? Are we going to abuse the emotions of those that are involved by getting them all ginned up about this, the gun violence thing, and use that to, to get them agitated rather than showing them love and empathy and understanding and trying to do something for them that would actually have helped in this situation? No, too many, almost, almost unanimously, ministers, except for the very conservative ones, are talking about gun violence, you know, gun regulations. We need to ban or out now gun confiscations. It's not going to happen in this country. This is a country that our culture, like it or not, there are people like me whose a great deal of their identity is wrapped up in the guns that they have, a great deal of their heritage, a great deal of their family traditions. A great deal of their family memories, a great deal of everything you know, about them is wrapped up in, in, in that. And so, and then you have the people that are the first, that are the Second Amendment defenders. So you're not going to do it. You're never going to get legislation through. All you're trying to do is score political points so you can besmeach the other party when it comes down to the election. It's just a strategy. They aren't trying to help anyone, and they're certainly not trying to deal with violence. But we need to. The last several days, I've been reading online, I've been talking to people online, I've been calling people on the phone, and I've been learning, and I've been studying, I've been thinking. And you know that's a dangerous thing, isn't it, Kim, when I start thinking? That's a really scary thing. <laughs> Yesterday, I talked to Randy Martin, and I'm going to go up and visit with him this week and talk to him about what we can do to help out with the school with some kind of an initiative, some kind of a program, whether it's mentoring or what have you, to help with bullying. Because if you look at the data, it's almost a 100% correlation between school <laughs> acts of school violence to bullying. The other two correlations that are really high are domestic violence and absentee fathers. You pick those three things and you pretty much got 100% of these incidents that happen. <clears throat> But bullying is the biggest. We gotta deal with bullying. We gotta deal with teaching our kids not to do that. And that's gonna be difficult because it's in our human nature to pick at a weak wound. Have you ever watched animals? Have you ever watched calves in a pen? Who do they go after? The weak one. They pick on the weak one. Somehow it's hardwired into the psyche of animals, even all the way down the chain. And human beings are, are no different than that. We, we pick at the weak wound. We have to somehow teach our children empathy. We somehow need to put our arms around that. And the difficult thing about that, whereas we can pass the legislation and we can walk the same way and say, hey, I passed the law. That's great. Now let's go have a latte. If you're really going to make a difference, you have to have a relationship with those kids, with those people that might act, cause those actions of violence. And besides perhaps pre preventing acts of violence, you might make someone, instead of being on welfare, that person you might make a difference in their life where they decide that they have confidence in themselves and they go on to be a professional or what have you. They might be successful in their life. You can make a difference. I wasn't kidding when I talked about Madeline. God only knows how many people's lives she impacted to the better. She doesn't know. She really doesn't care. All she knows is that that, that day she went over and helped somebody feel better. So at any rate, I'm going to go up and talk to Randy. And I'm going to try to figure out a way, maybe the men's group or whatever, and I'll come back and we'll talk about it in between. If anybody wants to go up there with me, let me know. Bill, you want to go up with me? What have you, or Clyde, or whoever. Uh, and we'll talk. We'll brainstorm. We'll figure out. We're going to have actions and we're going to do something that makes a difference. And beyond that, I do a little talking, and I will do some talking tomorrow. A good friend of mine has connections all the way up the food chain, all the way to Washington. And I don't doubt knowing him that he knows somebody that's in the cabinet. He knows everybody in this world. 
and I'm going to talk to him about it. And I'm pretty sure he was bullied as a child, so I'm pretty sure I can get him excited about it too. To come up with some kind of a national initiative along the lines of perhaps the DARE program. What it takes in this world is action, folks. It takes initiative, it takes persistence too. But what it doesn't take is playing the game of politics where you know it's not going to work. And what you were doing is you're giving people false hope and you're leading down the chain and then you yank it away and you only did that on purpose because you want them to do something for you, to vote for you and vote against the other guy because you ginned up a bunch of emotion. And the one thing that you'll notice when the people are screaming and hollering is usually the louder the rhetoric, the less logic, the less rationalization, the less real reality is behind that argument. Because when your argument is weak, double the volume. In fact, there's a quote like that. I forget the quote. Jerry shaking his head. Uh, there's a quote from a famous philosopher that it's along that lines, and I thought I'd been thinking of it earlier, I'd have looked it up. But at any rate, if you have ideas, talk, let's talk about them. Because it's violence that's a problem. If I don't take care of the violence, all I've done is rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic while it goes down. Because that kid's going to go from that deck chair that's that rifle or that pistol or what have you to, the, to that deck chair that's a knife or a machete, to that deck chair that's the hammer, to the deck chair that's the rock, or the deck chair that's, an, that's a car. Because I'll guarantee you, you can cause a lot more mayhem with an automobile than you ever could with a firearm. Much more. That guy out in Las Vegas that shot all those people, there were 22,000 people in that, in that arena, and he wounded, I forget what it was, 60 or something like that. If he'd have gotten concrete to a cement truck and drove through there, how many do you suppose he'd have killed? He could have been flipping, flipping cats in there and doing you, you know, cutting cookies, and he would have killed hundreds of them. So mayhem can be accomplished with any weapon. What we have to do to stop the mayhem and the violence is to get to the heart. Because it's here that's where the problem is. And I've pontificated enough. I'll let you be. But please, let's not just rearrange the deck chairs. Let's patch that hole in the boat. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do ask for guidance. We ask for your clarity. We ask for your love. We ask for your blessing upon us. And we ask that you help us find a way to heal the brokenhearted, those whose souls hurt so badly that they've lost all sense of empathy, they've lost all sense of hope, they've lost all sense of worth in themselves, and therefore they place no worth on others. Lord, we ask that we recognize that we celebrate and that we act upon the worth of every single one of your children. We ask that you give us Give us empathy. We ask that you give us guidance. We ask that you give us sympathy for those that are hurting right now. And we understand their cries for action. And even when it's misguided action, Lord, let us lend a listening ear and a comforting arm. And let us not be frustrated even when we are frustrated by that. Lord, let us, let us help this world on your behalf and through your blessing and through your guidance. 